It is my honor today to have Greg Boogie Down Bronx with us for Living Testimony. Hello, everybody. How you guys doing today? How you doing today, brother? Well, I'm doing well. You know, just relaxing and everything, ready to do my thing over here. So let's kick it. All right. So this is a little change of flavor for me uh, because you have a bit of an accent to me. You know, I'm a southern boy, down home, <laughs> Texas, cornbread eating. <laughs> But you sound like you got a, a little bit of a New York twang. Tell me a little, bit, a little bit about that. Well, actually, just like you said, I'm from the Bronx. When Most people call it the Boogie Down Bronx. And I grew up during the era where we knew and talked about the difference between rap and hip-hop. And rap is something you do. Hip-hop is a way of life. And lots of people call them both the same thing now. So I grew up in that era where... Grandmaster Flash stealing okay. electricity from okay. the lamppost and um, KRS One dictating everything that he wanted to, and okay. Africa Bambada lived in the next building from me. So that area was pretty easy. When I was doing that, I was learning how to rap and how to spit game, and KRS One was my idol at that particular time. Okay, listen here. We're going to walk all the way down through that because mm -hmm. I didn't know that stuff, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to be really interesting for our viewers. The one thing that I want to tell you is when I ask these questions, it's just a guide. Okay. Meaning, we're just going to walk through, try to get the decades on point, get things synced together, and then we'll just continue to roll and we'll understand where you are, where you went from then to now. Okay. I was, I was born at Fordham Hospital. Most people call it Fordham University. And I'm there for good athletic department. I, I pretty much grew up through there by the Bronx Zoo, different areas in, our, in the rap area. When we grew up around um, Fat Joe and Big Pun, and pretty much they lived in walking distance from me. As a matter of fact, my church at that particular time was pretty much on the same block that Fat Joe came up on. And um, then my mother moved from there to Bronx River, which is the Bronx River Projects. Then I moved back to Soundview and um, grew up a little bit down the street from Peter Guns. He was in that area as well. Okay. And then I went to Castle Hill, which is where my mom kind of brought me up in my teenage years. And people that are from that area, like J-Lo, later on came Cardi B and okay. so forth. So that whole area birthed a lot of stars that we see today. Okay, so that, that's, that, listen, you, you are running me down some Bronx <laughs> history, South, South Bronx. Yeah. Kill that noise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you what, how many siblings do you have? I have five in general. I'm the oldest. My mom okay. and dad are not married. My mom and, and dad met in South Carolina. I was conceived in the Bronx. Okay. My dad lives in Philly, had a different wife. My mom married a guy from Harlem. Okay. And um, he was a rough guy, trust me. <laughs> When you say you're from Harlem, them, them guys are fast. Yeah. Faster than just about any other borough in New York. Yeah. And they, they teach you gentlemen things without actually having hands on. Everything was like New Jack City type of atmosphere okay. during that particular time without having the buildings and sort of stuff that Wesley Snipes said he had in New Jack City. Oh, wow. But it, it was a lot going on. The Rutgers Playground was kicking. I used to go to the polo grounds to watch um, Converse versus Pro Kids, and I would watch Dr. J, Earl of Pearl Monroe, and um, play against each other with Henry Bibby, and all the old heads that got kids that are, are in the NBA now. So I was going to the parks, watching them, and it was crowded. The, the um, and ones where the guys were taught dribbling, dribbling and ball handling skills, came from the streets in New York, the playground bouncing off your knee. And I think the only person that pretty much does it close to that is um, Kyrie Irving from the Nets. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You know what? Listen, you got a lot of, you have a lot of good history just from the Bronx aspect and just overall New York. I mean, naming Rutgers and so many other things. Yeah. I think that um, I'm going to break this down a little further and go a little slower. Um, just so I get a full idea and picture. Now, you told me you have five siblings. You're the oldest. 
You yeah. told me that there were some rough guys that, that raised you, or one of them. You said you had Philly and you had New York. Yeah. And they taught you gentlemanly things because the, the your father, being from Harlem, um, was, was quick, and you had to learn quick. So tell me, you know, down here we call you know, getting into trouble or, or getting involved in street activity, we call that jumping off the porch. Okay. Tell me at what age uh, did you jump off the porch? Oh, I could say maybe from the time I was 12, I was more mischievous than any other time in my life. Oh my gosh. I was cutting school, and during that period of time, they would let you leave school to go home for lunch. Okay. So my school was only down the street, so I would go home, eat lunch, and sometimes wouldn't return back to school or go to uh, 42nd Street, we call it 40 Doo-Wop, and watch <laughs> movies, karate flicks, et cetera, et cetera. We did all of this. And from that time on, I just started venturing out, going to Washington Square Park, East New York, and down in the village and so forth, and just learning things that I wasn't supposed to do. Okay. And by the time my mom find out, found out, she would pretty much threaten to whip my behind. So that's pretty much what went on during that time. So like you, you said, um, your mom found out things that you weren't supposed to do. Tell me, tell me something that, that you did uh, that you had to learn a, a, a tough lesson on, but that helped you uh, get to where you are today. Um, the toughest lesson during that particular time is when they, they grilled me into playing music. I didn't want to do music. And I got drilled into playing the clarinet, moving on to other instruments. And from then until now, I could just say like the middle part of that, I picked up other instruments and as far as the French horn, the E flat horn, the bass guitar, drums, my last instrument was the piano. And that helped me because I've done some songs that you guys may have heard. Um, one, I played in the studio with a guy named Strafe. You probably heard the song over and over again. And it's called Set It Off. I played the percussion and set it off. I only got paid $2,500 for being in the studio during that time. Got no royalties. So that kind of like took me out of doing what I needed to do and try to move further. So I just went and got me an agent and started working on commercials like the Coke okay, commercial, okay. Pork and Pest Control commercial. Okay. I've done a couple of soap operas. I was an extra in all my children. Okay. Did films. I did two movies. See, I'm going to put you on pause, Greg, because you're taking me too fast. Look, you got to pull that New York stuff on me. <laughs> Let me Sorry take you about back. that. Right. So, so it's fine. So you, you grow up um, at one particular point, because I want to talk about it all. We're going to get to your movie career and all that good stuff. At one particular point, you get in trouble. Your mom tries to straighten you out. But you become, you get involved in law enforcement somehow. Tell me about that. Yes, uh... That was the toughest part of my life. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm going to let you know that because I was going to school at that particular time. And um, when I would get out of class, I would go home and roll up like 250 joints, put them in my briefcase. Mind you, I'm, I've always been a dresser. So I would dress in a Somani suit, Italian, double-breasted with gaiters on, and go sell loose joints in the movie theaters. One day when I came out the movie theaters, I didn't know undercover guys were watching me the whole time. So to top it off, I didn't pay my transportation fare. I just jumped over the turnstile okay. and they pulled me over and took me down to Central Booking. So they started talking about me and said, yo, this is the cleanest guy I've ever busted. So we're not going to take him down and just bust him. We're going to take him through the process. But what we're going to do is send him to the academy because he seems to dress nice and fit the part and he knows marijuana very well. So I did the marijuana thing and then it grew and populated from that. They gave me a job as um, a jump street cop at that particular time. So I would go into the colleges. and So so let, let, me, let me take him slow. Let me take him slow. <laughs> Boogie down. <laughs> So, basically, you're saying, uh, aside from the trouble you got into early on, 
you get into distributing marijuana. Yes. But you're doing it in such a fashion that it had never been done, or at least for the yes. for the NYPD. Yes. And they offer you a job? They offered me a job, put me in training for two weeks, and just sent me on out there. And I had to figure out who was the king pin or the queen pin in different colleges. And then it went on from there to grow to see if professors were pretty much and active with their students or trying to sleep with their students at that particular time. So it just went on and on. So when you talk about a 21 Jump Street cop, you really mean a 21 Jump Street cop, Jump like Street the television cop. show, like, like the 21. movie. Yes. You were infiltrating people based on your ability to connect yes. and providing information back to the authorities. Exactly. That's what I would have to do. And it's not a thing like called snitching at that particular time because that was my job. The thing about it is that when I became a cop, I wind up knowing at the time that I was a better drug dealer than I was a cop, <laughs> even though I was a pretty good cop. Okay, tell me about that. Walk me through that. Well, basically, I got a job at the um, Merrill Lynch in New York, so I always looked like an office person, so I always dressed to go into the office. Got the job at Merrill Lynch, then came and got an interview at Two World Trade Center with um, Dean Witter. So my bosses infiltrate, you know, infiltrated that and let me know that they wanted me to do this job because they knew the biggest drug dealers in the world was the guys on the corner. They weren't nickel and diamond. So they let me know that the, the most criminals were white collar workers. So I had to go in there and if I wanted something different or I would call an extension and say, yo, I need an A for that girl. If you wanted something different, you you, you asked for boy mm. or what have you. So you knew, you never had to leave that building for anything, not even to go home, you know, because there was two clubs in the building, bars, food courts. Now tell me this, is this during the crack era or is it before the crack era? It's, during the crack era, the crack era was just coming in. Okay. At that particular time, most people were doing weed and they were doing heroin. Okay. Right. And so uh, around what year is that? You're talking about in the late 70s. Okay. When they started, when crack, crack was being introduced at that particular time. And they called it free basin in the Bronx. Right. And, and yeah. you got to remember, like for, for Texas, um, I know that New York and California got it first, right? Yes. And so our crack era started in 84, 84-ish, uh, 86. Some people say 86. Yes. But you you guys were ahead. So, so yeah, I'm just trying to understand and, and, and put, put some time stamps on it. Um, so there's a building. There's all types of drugs being sold. It sounds like a drug hotline. Oh, <laughs> definitely. I mean, where you have your keyhole at in the door, they would just slide the money in there and put up their fingers on how much of what product they wanted. So at that particular thing is, if you mention in timeline, you're talking about from like 75 to about 83. Okay. That's, that's what I gathered from it. That's what I pretty much know because everything becomes a blur after a period of time if you've done so many things. For sure, for sure. So you walked me through the forest, but I know that there's a time and it may be gut wrenching, so you know, I, just bear with me as I ask you this. So you, you're on the force. You're on the force for a while, um, and at one particular time, during a, a drug bust or some sort, you lost your partner. Tell me about that. Yes, I, I've lost several people. You know, during that particular time, because it was a discrepancy. It was war battles between uh, New Jersey cops and New York cops. And then there was so much coming into where everything became, so to speak, mob related. Mm. And that particular time, so we couldn't even go over to Jersey unless we would let them know that we we're coming. So like the Frank Lucas movie? It like was sort of like, like wow. Frank, yes. And there were a couple of people more popular than what Frank Lu Lucas was. Even Mercury Morris and so forth, they used to play for Miami Dolphins and all of them and Charlie Mouse. And you just 
But with Frank Lucas, you just grazing the surface of that because Nicky Barnes was bigger than they portrayed him to be at that particular time. So um, it was a lot that's going on, and more that meets the eyes when it came to the way people handle things in different areas, put it that way. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So I know that um, having, to, having to deal with uh, befriending people, um, wow. <laughs> working with them, right? Smiles. Oh, yes. It, 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 it creates what I always call a dichotomy because there's you, the real you, mm. and then there's you, the work you. Yes. And those, should they ever become intertwined, there may be a problem. Yes. Tell me how you balance that. Uh, most of it came from work. Um, being that I, I thought I was a, a, a good looking guy at the time, so to speak, I would get women constantly. I, I would try to apply for different agencies, even escort agencies at that particular time. And um, even when I was working at the colleges and so forth, I would find out who a woman didn't like if she was the person in charge of all the drugs at that particular time. And I would try to get close to her. Most of those women didn't date or wouldn't even go out with nobody that came to the college or dealt with the drugs at all. So I had a way of going over to the woman and, you know, ask her, does she want to eat? Is, are you hungry? She says, no, I'm not. Don't be asking me out for a date. I said, I'm not asking you out for a date. I'm hungry. You want something to eat or not? <laughs> so I pretty much would do it that way. And then I see a guy that she's gritting on or pretty much, you know, she's giving the grizzly to. She didn't like him. So we would walk over and just, you know, hit that guy, take him out. Now she's going to show you interest in what she has because you knocked out somebody who she didn't like. So now it becomes official with you and her okay. having a relationship. Okay, you know? so you, you ran a whole short con mm -hmm. on them, but you yeah. actually physically assaulted folks yeah. to get I had, I confidence. Had, yes. At that particular time, you had to pretty much do what you had to do in order to maintain their budget or whatever they had to distribute to you. And the more money that you made on the bus, you got a percentage of it. So we were jealous even at that particular time when it came to the New Jersey cops because they would step on our territory and try to take our bus. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> let, me, let me stop and rewind. This is going to be like a scratch. Did you say that as an officer, you got a percentage of the <laughs> money based on what, when you busted someone? Yeah, you got 10%, 10% of that money. If, even if it came to where the boat was coming to the pier, and you, you know, they're going to sacrifice a ship. It's too many drugs involved. They're not going to bust them all. However, they would sacrifice a pawn. They're going to sacrifice that pawn. So they're going to make a bust for about $7 million. That's not even a part of what the real money could be. So out of that $7 million, they will give the different officers that work a certain percentage of Is whatever the percentage they're going to the police department or going uh, to individuals? All of it's going to the police department, but the individuals, DEA, which I was drug enforcement agent, we got a percentage of that. Wow. I get, maybe, I'm, maybe I've been sleeping on the rock. I didn't know that. So <laughs> yeah. when they're talking about these, you know, $2 million bus and $3 million bus, people, yeah. are, people are getting fat off of that. Oh, yeah, definitely getting fat off of that. I mean, even in the streets, you just take, you don't never turn in everything. At that particular time, you just didn't do it because you got to think about your kids going to college. You're thinking about, I want this house, but you can't touch that money and take it and spend it, you know, and you can't just come up with a new car or, you know, dookie rope gold chains and <laughs> stuff like that. You couldn't do that. But we, we wound up going into things and forgive me for this. We used to go into evidence and, and pretty much take what we wanted at that particular time as a bus heist or we would deal with people that would purchase drugs and want to play cards. We would have buy money, which at that particular time was called 7945s. So our bills were marked in order, if we caught you playing cards, we would think you're the ones 
that purchased this Sherman Henry, which was <laughs> which was basically what he did at that particular time, um, which was angel dust, you know. Okay, and, so yeah. Sherman Hemsley, for those who don't know, yeah. that's George Jefferson. George Jefferson. <laughs> exactly. I don't know how, how did that relate to Angel Dust? Because PCP and everything was considered Angel Dust at okay. that particular time. And Sherman Hemsley was pretty much heavily into that at that particular time. I didn't know that. Yeah. So George Jefferson was on wet. Yes, he was on wet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, you, you are educating me. You are educating me today, and mm -hmm. I'm and some of this stuff. I'm like, I can't get over because I'm like, okay, it's it makes nice. sense. It yeah. makes sense why when you talk about prison reform or you talk about our, our justice system, um, why it's the way that it is because they've basically monetized it on every level. So yeah. it makes sense to let some of the things go through, yeah. to stop some of the things so I can put my kids through college. And wow, it just blows my mind. So yeah. for the listeners, you, you you really helped us with that. So I got I got a question for you. I was talking to a guy on this very couch, a guy by the name of OGP, a good buddy of mine. Mm -hmm. And he did, he had a 16-year bid, he did 13 in the federal uh, prison system. And, um, you know, he talked about his remorse. He talked about the redemption, how we felt that you got to find a way um, you got to find a way out and you got to find something else. And it was heartfelt. But he also said the other thing that stopped him from ever coming back to that prison is one of the white officers said, man, I, I miss y'all. I love y'all. He's like, I use y'all to put my kids through college. But I tell you, what would I have? Yeah. And you just basically clarified yeah. that. Well, you need crime. In order for cops to have a job, crime has to exist. Because other than that, there will be no use or no need for the police at all. And there's different var variations of law when it comes. I'm not able to touch everything that a cop riding in a cruiser would do. Um, I would have to have proper proper cause to stop you. They can pull you over for a traffic light. My thing wasn't that. It was the drugs. And they even had pulled me over, the regular cops. I would just flash my bag out the window, or turn it back so they could see, and pull off because I didn't want them blowing what I was investigating at that particular time. So it's different levels of law enforcement when it comes to that. Everybody can't stop everybody. Everybody, you know, I don't know if you've seen the movie uh, Mod Squad with something like that as well. And they had different types of people that go into things who actually didn't have the real experience, but learn it on the job. Ah. That's what I did, I learned on the job. So did you have any Miami Vice type situations occur? Any any life changing busts that that you can share with us? Yes, I had to take a girl to to Rikers Island after busting her. That I, I I fell in love with her because she was a drug dealer, but she was so elegant. She she had this thing about her, and I would just go on every day and try to talk to the, you're talking about life change experience. So when it came to me busting her, they just said, okay, man, read her rights. And then she looked at me, she said, you a cop? She said, you a effing cop? <laughs> so she said, okay, you got me. She said, I never would think that you would be a cop, not you. And I would go and see her at Rikers Island like once every two months. And she said, you sure we're good. So that kind of changed my life mm. into some of the things that you are allowed to do and that you're not allowed to do because being that you're separating yourself from being a cop to a drug dealer, to a man that wants to get with a girl, it's, it's like so many different lifestyles wrapped up into one. And it's hard to, to fathom that for a lot of people. Yeah, it is. It is. It is the dichotomy. Matter of fact, it's, it's, more, it's more than a dichotomy <laughs> because, you know, when you're involved in that, when you're 21 Jump Street or, or, or you're Trouble Miami Vice and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff, yeah. how do you separate who you are, Mr. Boogie Down Bronx, and the, the officer? I had to separate myself. I had to relearn myself. And before I get to that, what I had to do was pretty much have certain times a day 
that I would meet up with certain kinds of people. And um, sometimes the day I was always a cop. It's like acting. You become a character. You put on a face, you put on a hat. And after that, you go right back to your life. Um, the bad part about that is that you can't have a serious relationship because you never know that whether you will make it back home or not or if you're ever going back home. So you have to separate all of this. Even on a movie that I made, I, I played a cop. I played a uniform cop during that time. Now, mind you, I was never uniform. So I played a cop in this movie called um, Heart of Midnight, and it stars a couple of people. You may have seen one of them in the Five Heartbeats, which was Choir Boy. Choir Boy, yeah. And, yes, him and I have been friends since 1980. We went to college together. Okay. Maryland. So him and I, he, he got me into learning different faces, learning my acting, learning how to separate the two, taught me my intervals when it came to music. Let's say he was my tutor and everything. So, you know, I got to meet people from him. And so I changed my lifestyle after I met people like Garrett Morris from Saturday Night Live, which lived in the same building. So... I just learned to have more class when it came to things like music, jazz. I started in classical, so I was well-rounded. Anyway, so the 4-4 four, four beat that I hear today, I don't just listen to the lyrics. I, you know, it just brought me out of separating the person to the musician, to the cop, to the husband. No, that makes sense. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it sounds like you use something from then and you're still working through it now. Oh, yes. I, I have it stressed. Mm -hmm. I've had stress. I had to walk away from that because we had bodies disappearing as cops. And Mayor what, Giuliani... What, what, does that, what does that mean? Bodies disappearing as cops? As cops. I've seen cops get thrown off the roof by other cops. I've seen write-ups being not written up properly. I've seen the paperwork being falsified totally. And this is all NYPD? This is well, all NYPD and some uh, New Jersey PD as well. And uh, we didn't have too much of a problem when it came to resigning because it, either if you wanted to resign or not, they're going to make it hard for you. You either resign or you they'll force you to resign by you not being here any longer on earth. So, so you either resign or they kill you? It was like I walked away from it. I had to disappear. I went to um, England. I went to um, Canada for a while. I just focused my mind more into my music. Okay. So I had Great. to leave that. I had to disappear. And I did it for roughly six years. Wow. Didn't contact my family, my brother and sister. And those, they didn't even know whether I was alive or dead. They had no idea. You know, it's, it's interesting. Most people that I have come sit on their couch, they are real American gangsters. Mm. You know, um, some of them have seen and done horrific things, but it's 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 awesome to take a look out of a different lens. Yes, your lens being that of an officer. Yes, but you're still experiencing the same type of traumas. Yes. So you watched an officer get thrown off the roof. Was it a friend of yours? That one I knew from being in a certain unit that we were rivals of. Now, I I've actually have things that are still around me now of the unit that I was a part of in the Bronx and Harlem. And I've lost partners. I've had partners that were trigger happy. I had to pull mine on occasion. I've even seen, when I bust houses, kids sitting around the table playing cards with cats on the table. I've even seen that. And that's the lifestyle that they live because they didn't know any better. That's what they were taught by the people that they grew in the house with. Now, go figure, a kid sitting at the table with, playing with his friends and gats and glocks and everything's all on the table. And, and to the, and like to the viewers, a, a gat is, is an 80s expression for a gun. Yes. So uh, he's talking about kids playing cards, but with real live guns that have real live yeah. ammunition. It's crazy. Yes. And I mean, it's like these people during that time, 
they were sacrificing their kids so they, they can escape. And like I said, I don't know if it was their kids per se, per se, but it could have been kids that wanted to get into the business, that wanted to learn the life at, a, at an early age. But that was one of the life-changing experiences for me as well. For sure. And so I would imagine there's, there's, there's some trauma there. Um, yes. Having to escape and go to England, having to go to Canada just to, to reinvent yourself and, yeah. and, and find some mental peace. There's, there's, there's trauma there. You have to speak with a psychiatrist and everything concerning it, which I still have that issue now because sometimes you can't sleep. You wake up in a cold sweat. Uh, your wife trying to figure out what's the matter. You can't share all of that information with everybody because they can't take that information. It's like when you go to the arm and you're driving a tank, but you got to run over people, their pancakes after that. And, and it's hard to explain the stuff that you see to people. And, Sometimes your own family don't believe what you've been through, you know? Mm. Yes. And so that's why we call this living testimony, mm. because for me, it's, 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 not a, it's not a gangster thing. It's a life thing, and yes. it's a life-changing thing. Yeah. And we call it our Saul to Paul moment. Yeah. So you, trying to do the right thing after doing the wrong thing, became an officer, and then you saw a lot of more wrong things that yes. you end up having to clear your mind from, <laughs> to find some more right. Yes. You know how hard it is to make a bus and they're cussing you out and they're threatening you. So when I make a bus and it's on the street, it all of them could have drugs, but I might excuse some of them because they're trying to cooperate. The one with the most mouth, that became his drugs. Mm. That became, all of it became his mm. at that particular time. So are those the kind of decisions that officers are making every single day? Every day. That's the kind they were making at that particular time. It's a different era, era right now. So it, it's, it's harder now to be a police officer more than any other time in life because of the things that they have to face or instant decisions that they have to make and the political views and the media. So we had no media. It's what it was, it's what, what, what it was called during that particular time. What was done, what was done. How you want to write this up? How are you going to do the paperwork on it? I no, it, it, it sounds like, you know, I, recently I, I saw what the five officers did in Tennessee. Yeah. Um, it kind of sounds like a, a gang. Tell me, tell me, give me your thoughts on what occurred recently. I, I'm, I haven't been watching the news for that reason. Is because of the fact that I know a lot of different things are going on and I didn't want to express my views when it came to my family or uh, get into the political part aspects of it or the religious aspects of it. So I kind of like ventured away from that. So to up the, the update moment of that, I truly don't know. Okay. So I don't want to really give my view on that. Please excuse me for that. No, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. Listen, any time. So... It seems like that hit close to home. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hey, listen, I have things like that that happen all the time. Yeah. Um, I, I've mentioned my father, so I, mm -hmm. I, I have certain things I have to say myself. Um, so tell me this, because I definitely want to get into your music. I want to get into your your acting. Um, but I must tell you, I am I am rather intrigued. Um, Thank you. Being a person that has gone to counseling seeing psychologists um, based on traumatic experiences I've had in my life. Mm. Um, I'm always intrigued when I talk to another person that I can tell has things hidden. Um, mm. Hidden behind the wall is what I call it. Yes, you it's, know, it's, it's on the wall. Smile, yes. but in the back of your mind, it could be a monster. Yeah. It depends on any given day, right? It takes anything to keep from snapping, man. I mean, it's it's... Anything that somebody could say to you out of the way will set you off. And I'm that kind of person to where I have to let the kindness override that. And so that's where I learned my mannerism from. Mm -hmm. I learned how to be a gentleman from all of that. I'm not just a male. I'm a man. There's a difference between being a male. A male can do just about anything that he wants to do, even produce kids. But it takes a man to step up to that plate 
and do what it is that he needs to do and do it for the righteousness and the betterness of his life and everybody else's life around him. That's right. That's right. So before we get into uh, where you are today, I want to ask you about your opinion on the state of hip hop music. I know that you talk about the Africa Bombadas and all of that. There's a lot of controversy around that name. But in this industry today, from what I understand, Kanye mentioned it, but they said that the industry is promoting black serial killers. And, and, and people are calling it drill music. Uh, you know, there's always been some form of gangsterism around yes. uh, hip hop. But these individuals are actually making a song, hearing their name, and going and what they call sliding or killing somebody. Mm. What are your thoughts on it? My particular thought on that is that their hormones are in their headphones. Mm. And, Say and that again. Their hormones are in their headphones. So whatever they try to produce lyrically, they want you to live that out. They want you to act it out. So you have lots of people that want to be even gangster rappers that probably went to private school mm. that don't have the lifestyle of that, but they want to say it. They want to act it out. They want to put on the, the, the rope chains. They want to pretend it tougher than what they actually are. Mm. But unless you grew up from a certain area that actually has that, you're not about what you say mm. about. You just want to portray what I call the character okay. that's acting. So the music and the beats are slamming. They're slamming <laughs> beats. Don't get that wrong. They're slamming beats. I, I pretty much appreciate the beats more than what I did when I was coming up. The beats are slamming that way. But my thing is, the music had disappeared as far as the strings and so forth. So my, my aspects on that is that it should have more strings than anything else. And maybe that's the way I feel because I grew up playing classical music. I grew up playing in clubs that Madonna played in, you know, the old heads and um, Gilded Sleeves and stage where, where a lot of different people played in the village in New York. I was able to enter that same stage. I did the Apollo on my own music twice. How did on, you do? On the original, I came in as first runner up twice. And um, that's where they had um, the MC was Kid Creole. Um, he was I'm from out of Harlem and so forth. So I did those kind of things at that particular time. And my life just grew from that point on. I just became a writer. Then I started writing music in Patterson, New Jersey for a group called Pure Pleasure. I was more of a writer than sort of like how Babyface was uh, infatuated with the thought of being in love. You don't have to be in love, but sometimes you got to write it from a lady's point of view, what they think, because you can't just make it about you because we thought guys were wimps who wrote love songs. Mm. So we couldn't do that. We had to get it from a woman's point of view. I mean, I could write baby songs all day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me this. So you, you go from 70s, then the crack era, then there's a there's a break, right? You, you, you mentally, you have to go get away and do something. Yes. So you reinvent yourself. Yes. You talked about, and I'm, I want to reiterate this because I want the viewers to, 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 to understand. There was a, 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 a movie in the African-American community, the Afro community, whatever you want to call it, called Five Heartbeats. One of my favorite, matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, Eddie, Eddie Kane was one of my favorite guys. Yes. yes but Choir right. Boy um, ended up being one of your friends. Now, tell me at what point is this the 80s? Is this the 90s? When did, when did the musical aspect and meeting with Choir Boy of Five Heartbeats uh, get introduced to you in your life? Well, to give you a little, go further back on that, I met, um, his name is Tico Wells. I met him, I was the vice president at, of my dorm in, um, at Bowie State. I went to Bowie State College in Maryland. And he came up to complain because he was studying for midterms that he couldn't study. The president of the dorm already went home, so I was the next in line. Him and I became friends right after that. We started going to 
the shows like the um, Spectrum at that, but not the Spectrum, the, um, can't think of the name of the place, but they had shows. We would go see the show, the old heads like the Barcades, Confunction, um, a lot of other groups. And I used to beat him. He didn't play ball, but he would come to the gym all the time. I would play ball like every Wednesday. Sugar Ray Leonard would come around. Okay. So we would pay, play pickup ball with Sugar Ray Leonard. Little Ray was only about four then. But I asked Ray, I said, what is your son going to do? He said, well, he likes Dr. J. He wants to be like Dr. J. So during that whole area, when I met Tico, we would go to different concerts. And we worked at Macy's together after that on where they throw the Thanksgiving parade every year. We worked there. He worked in executive man, used to sell briefcases and so forth. I worked in clubhouse, which sold blouses, Liz Claiborne and stuff like that. So we would go to Central Park to see concerts, the old heads like Simon and Garfunkel, Diana Ross when she rang out. We were there. We were there at those concerts. And um, from there, we just grew our friendship. We, we developed a band together called Trinity. Okay. And the name of um it was called Positive Musical Energy. He was our lead man. He was our uh, our lead soloist. He was that guy. He played piano. He was playing saxophone lots of time then. That's his main instrument. And from there we just grew until this day. I think he may have texted me a couple of days ago, but we've been friends since nineteen eighty and up until now. We still are. Wow. Yes. Well, that, that, that's that's good. I, I don't know of many friendships that last the test of time. Yes. Uh, and you're talking about decades. So yes. So cheers for that, for real. Yes. Thank you. So at one particular point, you, I saw a picture of you like at the White House, and you were like a level three or level two security or something. Tell me about that. I've earned that job from being a principal. In the summertime at Cheney University, we had a program called College for Teens. And um, we would put the kids in college over the summertime from eighth grade to 12th grade. If you went there four years in a row, you get a free year. But uh, the thing after that time, just give me a little bit more on that question that you just asked. Oh, just asking. Um, I, I know I saw some pictures of you at the yeah. White House. Uh, Doing security for some right, big right, names. So right. Just walk me down there. So, so during that, I was a little under what they call Secret Service. They would call me and pretty much ask, could I bodyguard for them because of the work that I've done? And they knew that I did some type of police work. They didn't know what it was. My wife at that particular time was a great English teacher, one of the best English teachers I've seen. And she was stern. She would edit the speeches for Hillary Clinton. I would bodyguard her at the Democratic Convention. Judge Mathis, I would bodyguard him. Dick Gregory. Um, it's, it's a lot of people that I can't even name. Mayor Barry, which you, you guys know as the most famous mayor, that's the one that got into a whole lot of things. And what he did, um, I can't give specifics, but he got reelected again, reelected for a second term. Now, he for the, was for the for the viewers who don't know about Mayor Barry. Yes, uh, he was out of D.C. A big scandal in the eighties. Uh, he yes. got got caught smoking crack and uh, with, the prostitute. with prostitutes. Yeah, uh, and so you, you you were his bodyguard. I was his bodyguard after the fact. He did that first. <laughs> he was a congressman after that. I was his bodyguard then. I was um. Greg Mathis, I did some work with him. Okay. Dick Gregory was the one that pretty much was more vocal than anything. He was like, you need to lose some weight. <laughs> he was more direct than anybody who came to me. Hillary Clinton was, she was really nice, put it that way. And believe it or not, a lot of people look at her skin color. She, she really hung around black people more than you think she would. Bill did as well. But Hillary, I knew more of, mm. you know, and she even introduced my daughter to this uh, sorority called Delta Sigma, Delta 
Sigma, Sigma theta. theta. Theta, right. And um, she introduced my daughter to it. She mentioned her. She called the name out in speeches. You know how they, the politicians talk and they will mention a certain person's name. They did that even with my daughter at the time. Now, till this day, my daughter has a double master's degree in education. Wow. You know, so it works wow. out good. She lives in Philadelphia. Hey, kudos for that. Because, you know, it, it tells me that the sacrifices you made, even though it may have caused trauma. Yes, it did. Um, it seems like God was walking you through something. Because yeah. had you not experienced those traumatic experiences, had you not been selling the weed, yeah. um, you would have yeah. not likely ended up with Hillary Clinton, right. and Marion Barry, and Judge Greg Mathis. Yes. So tell me, when you look back at your life, Okay, okay. Yeah, I saw some flicker. Now let me remember what I just said, because that one is not written down. Uh, I, I got it. We'll figure it out. Really? So, it, it looks like the things that you experienced in life, even from the selling marijuana, to being recognized by cops, to start doing undercover work, so ultimately experiencing a lot of trauma, meeting good friends in the music and, and movie industry, projected you to meeting the, the likes of a Hillary Clinton and a uh, Marion Barry and a uh, Greg Mathis and having jobs with them. So if you look back on your life, all good, bad, and indifferent, what would you say today to a 16-year-old, Greg the Boogie Down Bronx? Um, today, my life has changed dramatically. You're talking about oh, since 98 on until now. My thing is, they know me from music, even the 16-year-olds, even the ones that became, called themselves saved. So when rappers will come to me and say, well, um, I need you to do the closing track on um, my demo tape, you know, or my... CD, and I would say, okay, what's the what's the track about? They said, we just want you to pray. We want you to pretty much just thank God for everything. I said, well, let's talk about, you want me to do track 17? Let's talk about tracks one through 16 first. So let's get that in mind. So I would let them know whatever you're trying to portray, just make make it, uh, uh, what do you, make, make it an art. You know, mm -hmm. make it an art to where you're known as an artist. Just say something positive. It's in the rim of them. Like if you're going to say, even if you was to say, say no to drugs, say why. Let people know why you want them to mm -hmm. do it. Just yeah, don't say, say no. But tell them the way uh, of what you've experienced in it, which is the reason why you're not doing it today. So that became part of my ministry today. You know, I, I don't know whether you knew I was a minister or not, but that became part of what I do today. So tell us about that. Uh, I post a lot of things now because of being a musician, just like um, the way David talks um, to God by writing them songs and, you know, God turning them into mm -hmm. praise songs. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. I write about the chief musician. Two ways we look at the chief of, of being the head of everything. To me, God is the chief musician because that's what David wrote his psalms to, and that's what I'm writing about now. Because whatever I can spread that's positive from taking you out of a mediocre mindset and don't settle for mediocrity, no matter what you do, just try to be the best at whatever it is that you do. Don't let mediocrity stop you from growing. Because anything that doesn't grow is dead. It's like a tree that grown up and then it stopped bearing leaves and then it deteriorates. Mm -hmm. So it's already dead. It just hadn't gotten in the ground at that particular time. But anything that does not grow is dead. That means if anything stops learning, it's dead. You got to continue your growth in life. So that's what I want them to pretty much put out as a message okay. today. Okay. I mean, that's a great message. So... We said we'd get to the movie stuff. So walk us through your movie experience, the people you've worked with, and what you learned from that. Well, 
The thing about that is just a learning process of being a character. Sometimes you get to do 32 takes and sometimes you only get one good take. Sometimes you're working with three or four, five cameras. Sometimes you only get one camera. Um, just the budgets, the salary, everything on that perspective is really as hard as you're working. Now, even in that business, you're only as good as your last job. How many credits you get, and when you see them rolling down at the end of the film, how many credits you get, the more jobs you're able to mm. get. And you have to, uh, this union that you become, it's called SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, and you have to be a part of that in order for you to continually work if you're in the union to make sure that they pay for all your hotels, that they give you vitamins every day or and pay for your hotels, and they can only work you um, a certain amount of time a day before you get turnaround time before they can work you again. So those things I've learned, I've learned to grow on it. I bared away from some of the things because of my lifestyle of approximately, even with that six years ago, my friend, I told you, the one that was his choir boy, had called me. He was doing some background singing for Earth, Wind and Fire at that particular time. And he called me. He says, listen, you need to get out of here. You need to get here in California. He says, because Earth, Wind and Fire needs more percussionists. And you know that they are heavy in percussion. Mm -hmm. And I was telling Tico at the time, I said, listen, I can't get out there. I, I just got married. So that's being on the road all the time, and you guys are never in the state. So I just got married. I'm going to just get divorced <laughs> because I know what comes with that. I know about the groupies from my previous groups. I knew when it came to letting certain people backstage, giving them backstage pass, I had my pick. Let her in. Her, no, not her. her. You come on. You know? And... We just had just things that we would do with the girls. And I can't even say what I would call it, <laughs> but I would say in a way, if you can, I don't know if you have to edit it, is uh, I would put them on a Neil and Bob show starring Neil and Bob. Okay. You know, I would, I would actually learn <laughs> certain things as far as being a groupie, at, I mean, as far as being a, a musician at that time, as far as having groupies and didn't want to go to Earth, Wind, and Fire because of all of the things that occurred with that. And I just didn't want to do that. I, the money, I know was outstanding. Yeah. But I didn't want to let, lose my life again because of the love that I had for money. I mean, I could have been driving anything I want to. I could have been living anywhere I want to. But penalties, you got to pay with that. You know, you brought up a very, very good point. Um, I mean, I've seen my share of things. I've been involved in my share of things, and mm -hmm. I've done my music, and I've traveled overseas, and I've done many things. And online, they have these uh, theories and, and, and um, conspiracy theories, and they talk about the Illuminati. And I can't tell you whether it exists or not, but I can tell you, according to Scripture, that there are wicked things in high places mm -hmm. um, and spiritual things, you know, principalities, powers. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen them. It's called debauchery. Okay. Debauchery. So the things that you're describing, it sounds like from the group is to the Neil and Bob show. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, it's, it's a, another form of debauchery. Yes. Um, and you're fighting to keep your soul clean. Yes. I mean, the way I saw it at that particular time and in the music industry and all the girls that came with it, I thought at that particular time, I wasn't too far behind women dealt with like Wilt Chamberlain. Mm. I thought I wasn't too far behind me mm. and his go. Because sometimes it was twice a day, three times a day, and overnight or different states, different people. I thank God that I'm still living today, bypass all of those diseases and like AIDS and so forth that came out during that time. I mean, you you, you got to go back and, and I thank God today for that, that I have none of those bad diseases, that I survived it, 
I would wake up the next day and the girl was like, what's your name? Huh? Baby, ain't it? That's what I've been calling you. <laughs> you answered to it. So that's the way it was at that particular time. So mm-hmm. I'm just glad that I became a more insightful person when it came to doing things that were more responsible in life. That previous life, I couldn't tell nobody about. It was hard because my mom wouldn't even hear part of it. My mom doesn't know where I've been for a certain amount of years. My brothers, my sister, none of them knew. I just, when I felt the urge to get up and go, if I had to do something, that's exactly what I did. Mm. It, it, this has been an amazing interview for me, Greg, to, to, to really understand uh, and dive into uh, your life. And I thank you for sharing a portion of it with us. Um, the part that I, I still can't shake or get over is the fact that there are so many things that it sounds like must remain hidden. Not the ministry. <laughs> <laughs> but not the ministry. And so for me, um, just speaking on myself, there are so many things I do not share. Um, but I try to be an open book about others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell me how you're using the things that you can share to inspire and motivate people today? I use that when I preach. I I use every aspect of my life or the growth that I had, even the law enforcement part, when I preach. I I touch a lot of people when it comes to when I speak and I pretty much will put it in story form. I might open with Psalms 40 and I bear off. I can, for a younger crowd, I, I might even relate it to a cartoon, but I'm tying it back into what the purpose of my story would be. And um, my pastor, my bishop, they would tell me I have a good way of bringing things back when you find yourself losing your place. But my thing is not always losing my place. It's just that the average American only have like a 20 minute attention span. And then they'll go from that. So the thing is, is that I try to make it as interested as possible to get back to that point. Mm -hmm. Even if I have to bear off and teach and preach or use a song or, you know, about that. And that that song that might come out today, I'll use as an example. And I would just use that song because I'm bringing them back to where I need them to be and then go back to my story. The average book, the average magazine and everything that is written today for everybody to read is written on a fifth grade level. And that's just so everybody can understand. Mm. And you have to make it easier because everything can't be, you know, Wall Street Journal because everybody's not going to understand that. So they have to write all the magazines, mostly in the fifth grade level. That's, That's good stuff. Really good stuff. So tell me now, um, are you working on any projects, anything that you want to promote, share, um, that we can share with the people? At this particular time, I'm not working on anything that I can talk about. I'm writing just a book, and it's about my life story, just like as what we were doing, but I'll be able to mention a bit more. I haven't entitled it yet because I'm going bits by bits. Sometimes you have to start at the end before you get to the beginning. Mm-hmm. And that's the way that I view everything. And um, from the birth of me, from the time that when I was born, my mom was going to give me up for an ad- adoption. My dad didn't want anything to do with my mom at that particular time because of our grandparents. So being that I was the first grandson in the family, my grandfather was the one that took me in as his own and said, nobody's going to give away my first grandson. Mm. So he already had nine kids and we were all living in an apartment in the Bronx. We had four bedrooms in the Bronx. And, um, and even with that, he kind of like, I stood up under his wing. He went to a card game. I sat on his lap. Everything that he did, I cherished him for that even up until the day he died. So I'm just writing a book concerning this. And I had mommy and daddy issues all of my life. 
Mm. You know, I had it all of my life. So it's a thing that I'm not as bitter as I should have been. This is why I became that child that disappeared and God brought the, the prodigal son back home. I was that prodigal child. I was the prodigal son when it came to that. So I got back home. They feasted just like they did in the Bible, just like it was Thanksgiving, like it was a special holiday. All of my family came over to this one apartment in the Bronx and embraced me. Where have you been? This is such, such. Don't ever do that again. We love you. This one. But I wasn't feeling that love. Mm. I didn't. Everything that got touched at that particular time that was unlike them became my problem. I was the one that did it. I was the bad guy. Even though if I didn't know nothing about it, I was the one that got blamed for it. So till this day, it's an issue that's in my head that I never really shared with nobody, not even my mother. My mother knew that I felt a certain kind of way, but I practice forgiveness every day. And being that my heart is the way it is, and how could I preach to someone else without forgiving the people that I thought that hurt me in my life? So that's what I'm writing my book about. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, hopefully you're able to share a little bit more because for me, um, and these guys hear it all the time, we're at Love Deposit Studios. And, and in here, when I talk about living testimony, you know, there's a test that you endure in life. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like even walking through your story and seeing if you would have given up with the marijuana, if you would have given up with the cop, if you would have given you wouldn't have made it to the other part. So that's why exactly. we say testimony. So yeah. A lot of times when people talk, they only want to talk about, here I am, I'm a, I'm a rose, I blossom, or here I am, I'm a diamond. But what, what do we say? Yeah. When we're playing dominoes. I don't even think people know yeah. what that is. Yes. We say that pressure will bust the pipe, or we say pressure will build a diamond. But nobody wants to talk about that fire, that pressure. And I'm like, share, share the pain of that pressure. Yes. And that'll either cause someone not to enter the, into the blender, is what I call yeah. it when I'm talking about the street, or, or, or cause them to make better decisions. But when you only show the end product, um, it's what I call false advertising. So yes. I thank you yes. for making us a part of your story today. And man, when you want to share some additional things, feel free to reach out. My friend, Mr. Greg Boogie Down Bronx. I thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate this.